Lord, settle and center our hearts and open them up to hear your word. We want to draw close, Lord, and we want to be drawn out to your truth, to your love. We want to come back to the center. Thank you for the faith and desire that's in this room. May these words protect that faith and that desire. May these words increase that faith and desire. We pray because we believe Jesus is praying within us. We pray, therefore, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope we can move forward from last night. Uh, I felt in some ways I was uh, scattered, and yet it was trying to uh, set an overall stage for maybe the things we'd, we'd like to deal with these days. I'd like to talk a bit this morning about the kingdom. I believe that that is the key teaching of Jesus, and I believe in many ways it's the key teaching that uh, has allowed us, because it hasn't been taught perhaps, or hasn't been proclaimed with the ferocity that Jesus proclaimed it with, that, um, that perhaps we've become very adept at creating idols. And uh, much of Western religion has allowed to become idolatrous, even in terms of itself. It's no accident that religion is associated with the setting up of idols, huh? the setting up of idols, and that the first commandment was not to do that. And as we, we said already last night, uh, religion itself can make an idol of itself. And that's exactly what Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom tells us not to do. That we are not to make absolutes of things, including our own explanations, including our own self-understandings, including our self-importance, including our self-image, including our image of ourself as good or holy or righteous, including uh, the institution of religion itself. Whenever the, the uh, doctrine of the kingdom is not proclaimed in the way Jesus proclaimed it, that's what happens to religion. It becomes a master at creating idols. And, uh, you know, Bede Griffiths, the uh, English Benedictine, he, he has founded this ashram or school in India where he's been, I guess, for 20, 30 years now. And when he went there uh, to, to form his school of, of prayer, he said something that is, is shocking, uh, maybe maybe exaggerated, but it has certainly a level of truth to it. And he was in a, a stage of almost despair about Western Christianity. He said, I don't think people in the West can know God. I just don't think it's possible. He said, uh, all they keep doing is meeting themselves, meeting themselves and calling it God. I don't think Western Christianity, he said, has the power to, to lead people to God anymore. Now, that's scary. I hope it's not true, because here we are in the Western church. But he went off to the East, and he said, here is a culture which, uh, which can, can, as we were saying last night, get people enough out of the way so that God is possible uh, to enter in. So it's possible for God to enter in. And... Um, Maybe that's because the kingdom can more easily be proclaimed. There is not so much trust in this world, in this system. There is a, a world where it's not possible. It's not possible to do such a thing. They have not put their trust in, in outer technology and in a philosophy of progress and a philosophy of achievement the way we have. What's idealized in India is the, the holy man, the holy woman. The person who is searching for their truth in, in some kind of inner freedom and not in the kind of outer freedoms that Western societies proclaim. When we talk about freedom, uh, we largely mean freedom in terms of two things. Freedom in terms of space, to have uh, mobility, the freedom to move around. Right? That's an outer definition of freedom. And freedom in terms of time. We have a mania for time-saving, uh, you know, little consumer objects, supposedly that are going to save us time. 
And yet the irony is you've never seen a people with as little time as Westerners. And we have a kitchen filled with 50 uh, time-saving and, and uh, work-saving objects. It's so ironic. And you'll go to third world countries and you say, well, you have a little time to talk uh, all the rest of my life, they'll say, you know, and sit down with you for the rest of the afternoon to share themselves with you. And here we are with these, uh, these objects and, and uh, gadgets that are supposed to save us time, and no one has less time than us. It's almost a trick of the gods, if you can call it that. Huh? <laughs> Or something that doesn't make any sense. We should have more time than anybody, but we don't have enough time at all. Um, we've def defined freedom falsely as an outer thing in terms of time, in terms of space, in terms of options. Americans think they're free if they have more options. I'm free because I can choose. And in fact, what's happened is we're paralyzed by our options. Paralyzed, absolutely, because we have so many choices, and so we do not have to surrender to any one of them. There's always another door to open, another way to go. Now, I believe Jesus wanted to relativize all of these so called freedoms we have, these so called choices we have, this freedom of time and space and options, uh, by proclaiming that there's only one thing absolute, and that's what he meant by this reality of the kingdom. So let's spend a little time with it and see if we can clarify what, what maybe Jesus meant by the kingdom. Uh, let me use the scriptures first of all, especially the 10th chapter of Matthew. As you go, proclaim that the kingdom is close at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. You received without charge, give without charge. Provide yourself with no gold or silver, not even a few coppers for your purses, no haversack for the journey, or spare tunic or footwear or staff, for the workman des deserves his keep or her keep. So somehow these people are to be audiovisual aids of what they're talking about. And they're images of mobility in a new sense, of freedom in a different sense. There's, there's nothing to tie them down because there, there's nowhere here that they've, they've sunk themselves into. This isn't it. This isn't it. So they're always free to go, to, to let go, to go to some place new because they haven't sucked, sunk their roots into this place. Um, that's different than the image of church that, that uh, I heard proclaimed. And maybe that's because, and that's the first point I'd like to make, is we confuse kingdom and church. We got them all confused and all messed up, so much so that at least my generation seemed to have pretty much thought that the kingdom and the church were the same thing, and therefore made an idol of the church. The church is not the same as the kingdom. The church is a means to proclaim, to announce, to be, as I say here, an audiovisual aid of absolute reality, of what really matters, of what really lasts. When the church makes an idol of itself, makes an end of itself instead of a means, it no longer has the power to proclaim the truth because it no longer lives the truth. It seeks its own securities instead of proclaiming the absolute. Instead of proclaiming the really real, it makes itself the really real and demands that we bow down before it instead of let go of, of the momentary, let go of the passing, let go of the relative for the sake of the absolute. As the Zen masters say, and as Merton liked to repeat, all of these religious gifts that are given to us are no more than fingers pointing to the moon. They're all fingers pointing to the moon. What religion does is endlessly get involved with the fingers, with defining them, with, with proclaiming them, with protecting them, with fighting about which finger is better and bigger and more important, which finger is going to save you, instead of uh, paying attention to the moon. And that everything, everything in the light of the proclamation of, of the one truth, the kingdom of God, is a means, is a finger. And it's the moon that matters. And that includes pope, that includes institutional church, that includes Bible, that includes sacraments, that includes priesthood. All of these things that we spend 90% of our time worrying about huh, are the fingers, <laughs> defining them and, and uh, arguing about which form is better than another. You look even at uh, the Protestant Reformation, we must always remember that Protestantism is a child of Catholicism and inva invariably fights the same battles and games we do uh, a few hundred years later. And, and what are the arguments? What are the, uh, 
the big debates at the time of the Reformation. No one is debating or arguing over uh, who's, who's uh, creating better contemplative people or more holy people, who's taking care of the widows and the orphans better. Huh? All the arguments are over who uh, has the, 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 the true power and who has the true authority. Right? They're ego questions. They're ego questions. So who's right? Who's first? Who's best? Who's got the truth? It's, it's competitive questions of, of, of group narcissism. Huh? It's not really surrender questions of, of who has let go better, who is following Jesus better, in terms of, of who is most identified with the least of the brothers and sisters. Did any church ever divide over that? Do you know of a single church that ever formed over who's taking care of the widows and the orphans better? No. It's always who's got the true priesthood, who defines Eucharist correctly. It's all head games and power games huh? because the ego is still in charge. The, uh, the need to be first, the need to be in control, the need to be important, the need to be right, not really the need to be in love with God, the need to let go of the self and not to be right, hmm? which might much more be the question of the person who's, who's uh, content to be last instead of needing to be first. Let's look a little more at the scriptures. As you enter the house, salute it. And if the house deserves it, let your peace descend upon it. If it does not, let your peace come back. And if they don't accept what you're saying, shake the dust from your feet. Here's a free people. Huh? Don't carry your garbage with you. Don't carry your hurts with you. Let go of it, because that's not what matters. It's not matters. what matters to be accepted, to be received, to be successful, to be right. Let go of it. Go on. Go on. There's something more I have to teach you. True power is never lost. Huh? If you have the power, if you've, if you've been to the center, no group's rejection can take that away from you. Remember, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, so be as cunning as serpents as, and as harmless as doves. A wonderful paradox. You can go with that for hours about the levels of meaning that might be there. To be a part of it and yet not a part of it at all. Huh? To, uh, to, be, to be given and yet to be surrendered at the same time. To be innocent and, and almost naive because you're not asking the questions of the world or the questions of the system. And yet, on another level, to know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. To know how to be engaged and yet to be disengaged at the very same moment. And he says, beware of people. If you live this way, if you live this kind of engagement that, that doesn't matter at all, to, to care about nothing and yet to care about everything in the same moment. To live that kind of paradoxical life that frees you from the seductions of the system. Beware, he says, because when you live with that kind of freedom, they're going to hand you over to Sanhedrins, scourge you in synagogues, you will drag bef be dragged before governors and kings. Those are the four levels of authority, the two levels of church authority, the two levels of political authority. He said all four levels are going to hate you. Because hmm? we can't deal, systems, self-protective systems, church and state, cannot deal with free people, cannot deal with kingdom people. Hmm? Uh, I uh, recently gave a retreat to a diocese. <clears throat> You'll probably be able to figure out which one it was. Uh, a diocese where the bishop is being uh, uh, not understood, let's put it that way, by the, uh, by the greater church. And there were 180 priests and two bishops on this retreat. You know? And um, I was able to talk to this bishop uh, for some time uh, privately. And it's just so striking that the man is a man of tremendous prayer a man of tremendous integrity and humility. It's like, oh my gosh, if I could have a father figure, this would be it. You know? This is what we should want to be producing. This is, this is a kingdom man. You know? This is the goal. But it's like a self-protective system where the first question is, are you a company man? Hmm? Well, that's the first question. Are you a company man? Not whether you're a kingdom man. Right? Uh, then that doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work anymore. That very kind of person is a threat to the system because the first question is not loyalty to the system. The first question is loyalty to God. And that's why Jesus says here, the synagogues themselves are going to whip you and persecute you, the Sanhedrins, the governors, and the kings. Your loyalty is not going to be to the political system of either church or state. Your loyalty is going to be to God. And get ready for, for even otherwise 
good people to not understand what you're saying. Now, we, we've lost that creative tension. We lumped it all together. We lumped it all together. This, this being religious and being a person of the kingdom. And the, the sad result is we haven't produced, uh, it seems to me, nearly enough kingdom people. Brother will betray brother to death, and sister, sister, I'm sure. The father, his child. Children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. The, the Christianity that I have seen emerge in the West has been, uh, in great part, a Christianity of being nice. Mm -hmm. The Christianity of being proper, where, again, create nice nuclear families. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about something other than that, something beyond that, which terrifies all of us in its truthfulness and in its demand. J.L. McKenzie uh, recently wrote a book, and, uh, you know, he's a man, I guess, in his late 70s now, and he says, the great thing about being an old man is you can finally say what you really know is the truth. I just can't wait. I just can't wait. You can finally say what you really know is the truth instead of always saying things that you know other people want you to say and pleasing kind of statements. Well, what he says, he says, let's just admit, you know, he's this great scripture scholar who wrote the dictionary of the Bible single-handedly. He's so brilliant. He says, let's just admit that, that much of Western civilization and, and the, the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed have made terrible bedfellows. And we have prostituted the teaching of Jesus from the very beginning and used it to serve our own purposes, used it to, to protect European societies and invariably the, the society from the top, those who are the beneficiaries of the system, who are usually the wealthy and the clergy. And again and again, the gospel was read from the side of what protected the privileges of the clergy, what protected the privileges of the wealthy instead of really reading it at all of its daring truth, which isn't saying either of those things. It is not creating a clergy class of people who have all spiritual wisdom and truth and making the laity eternally dependent upon them for salvation. And yet that's the way we read the Gospels, because who was reading the Gospels? We clergy, all right? Certain passages, as I mentioned last night, just never seemed to occur to us. I came out of Catholic schools and basically... I knew three scripture quotes. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock that will build my church. Fine quote. I believe it has great, great meaning and power. But does it ever occur to you that would be a quote that hierarchs would notice? A lady who's raising eight children and, and learning how to survive, and, and uh, she, that probably would not be the first quote that would jump out of the four Gospels to her. It just wouldn't, you know. Maybe it'd be the widow's might. Maybe it'd be something about forgiveness. Uh, it might be uh, loads of other things. But thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church would simply not be the first quote that would jump out at her. Huh? This is my body, this is my blood. Thank God for the gift of the Eucharist. And we know its central meaning, but how that sacrament has been domesticated and made something soft and aesthetic and pretty and nice hmm? and has lost the powerful symbolism of the, of the pouring of blood, the losing of life, the surrendering of life, the letting go of life. The, the original symbols are not pretty and aesthetic and nice. They're, they're gutsy and powerful and demanding and are talking an awful lot about death. Why, perhaps, well, did we center in on, on such a quote? Well, thank God we did on some levels, but on some other levels, it, it, of course, was, was the sacrament which kept defining the church and defining the need of the, of the laity for the clergy, kept you close to us, because you can't have Jesus without me, because huh? I'm the only one who can bring you Jesus. Well, Jesus in a certain sacramental gift and form, yes, but, but there are far other levels, many other levels, in which, which we've got to teach our people to recognize Christ. And in fact, in the last judgment scene of Matthew 25, uh, you know, Jesus doesn't say anything about how many times did you go to Mass. Huh? That isn't even a criteria for him. And yet you would have thought that was the be-all and the end-all of, of Catholic Christianity was going to Mass. And again, hear me, I'm not putting down the Eucharist, but let's put it in context and realize that we've made idols of things, even the holy things, for our own purposes and for our own needs. It became a, a managerial tool 
to control the laity and to keep the whole thing together. Now, nobody intended it that way. No vicious person planned it that way up in their head. But why did it retain such dominance? And why? How can we understand the present moment of history when the Lord seems to be taking away the priesthood all, all over the world? It's obvious the Lord's saying, hey, there's something else that has to be learned here by this people. There's something else that has to be understood. Uh, that's the only way I can understand this movement of history, this moment of history. When we've been praying and praying and praying for vocations, either the Lord does not answer our prayers or the Lord has a better idea. Hmm? And to say that you, we've got to learn how to be the people of God. We've got to learn how to quite simply pray before we immediately jump people into social prayer which when we bring no in-depth life to it, no converted life, no surrendered life to the social form of prayer, and we priests have certainly seen it, liturgy falls so flat. You keep handing out the bread and, and the cup. This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And, and yet you don't meet a surrendered people who, who are also pouring out their lives and, and surrendering their body and blood. And these are sometimes the very people who every day or eating of the bread and drinking of the cup and live entirely self-centered and self-protective lives. And you have to say after a while, well, is this a breakthrough sacrament or in fact a disguise to keep from doing what it's talking about? So the ritual becomes a substitute for the reality. Keep performing the ritual of, of body broken and blood poured out. And we domesticate it and turn it again into a consumer object, a devotional practice to make me feel holy, to make me feel good about myself in the morning, instead of really, hey, this is defining my action for the day. I've got to live a life that lets go. And I don't just go right from church to the mall and spend a day consuming more objects the way I consumed Jesus. Huh? And, and, and it's very interesting. I know priests are aware of this. The main way you can get Catholics to come to church is whenever they get something, huh? as long as they get something. It always amazes us how they turn out on Ash Wednesday. Huh? They were just telling me in Albuquerque, they said, get ready for Ash Wednesday. They are outside the door, lined up into the street for ashes, because they're getting, and that they, they don't even have to come. You know, it's not even a holy day. But as soon as Catholics get something, they're there. If it's palms, you know, certainly if it's the Eucharist, and even if it's ashes. As long as I'm getting something, I feel holy, you know. Now, doesn't that reveal the consumer mentality? And, and if you want to make sure you're not going to get a big crowd, talk on peace and justice, all right? All right. All right. As soon as i got to give something or let go of something, they will not show up. You can predict it. You know, they will not show up. I was always so happy that I was not identified with the healing ministry because... Uh, Everybody who puts healer behind their name, now again, you're going to get crowds, just unbelievable crowds come because you're going to get something, or you hope you're going to get something. I'm going to get healed. But, uh, well, what I'm trying to say is without knowing it and without wanting to, we've, we've allowed our people to live there and think that was Christianity and think they were, were, were surrendering themselves. The third quote uh, you should never mention numbers. You always have to say all three of them. Then uh, is of course the one on the uh, on the sacrament of penance. Uh, Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you are, shall retain, they are retained. Which of course was a handy quote for the priesthood to, to to proclaim and thank God for it. But of course, if we go back to the scriptures. Jesus is saying it to the whole community of disciples, and it's not saying it to this select group. Huh? That we all have to learn this power of forgiveness, this power of of uh, letting one another be un, unbound and free one another from the ways that we have tied one another up in, a, in unforgiveness. Do not be afraid of them, therefore, he says. For everything that is now covered will be uncovered. Everything now hidden will be made clear. Do not be afraid, he repeats it again, of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Fear the person, rather, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So he's, he's calling the person to a, uh, an identity that is interior instead of constantly defining ourselves by our exterior self, our body. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. It is not peace I have come to bring, but a sword. This isn't a Christianity of niceness, hmm? of pretty words and feel-good experiences. 
I, I would... I would think it'd be fair to say, of all probably, I wonder how many thousands of sermons I've heard in my life since I was a young boy and went through the seminary and everything. But I'll bet a good 70 to 80 percent of them, of this, all the sermons I've ever heard, have basically been about being nice. That's how domestic the gospel has become. It isn't really God's truth and this world entering into the collision course that they're on but somehow that we can have them both, and how to be nice in this world, and how to live a nice life, how to be proper and respectable and middle class and, and uh, be conventional. There, there's nothing more dangerous to true religious thinking than conventionalism, hmm? than being like everybody else in, in Western Hills, huh? being like everybody else in Cincinnati. Huh? And I'd say that if I was in any other city, by the way. <laughs> There's just, there's no depth to that. There's no power to that. The masses are never going to be ready for the word of let go, for the word of surrender, for the word of going beyond the self. They can't be. And one of the great disadvantages, there's many advantages to being Catholic, but one of the great disadvantages is much of our experience came from countries, European countries, where we were the majority and so Catholicism and its spirituality, except for the early desert fathers and mothers, has grown in an environment of majority rule, of mass consciousness, of expecting everybody to be Catholic, of expecting everybody to be in the game together. We, we don't understand. I've had to meet with people like Mennonites and Quakers and Amish and people who have always been minorities to meet more radical Christianity, to meet people who, who really take these Gospels and, and say, what's it really saying? And to try to hear it seriously. Catholics have never been forced to do that because we've had the support of the masses, of everybody here on the block being Catholic. I remember when I preached in Ireland, seeing the difference in Catholicism in, in Southern Ireland and in Northern Ireland. I found it, frankly, impotent in, in, in Southern Ireland. It's cultural. Not that there aren't great, great saints sprinkled through there. But, you know, the state of church, the state of liturgy, the state of, is just so cultural, so bland, so ho-hum, so business as usual. And then you go up to Northern Ireland, where I gave retreat to the priests who had to struggle for why they believe, the nature of belief, Christians hating one another. And... And it was just two different kinds of priests, two utterly different kinds of priests. Those have to really struggle with why they believe and those who are just basically on a conveyor belt. And conveyor belt Christianity doesn't, doesn't produce much power. We have this false support of everybody else, this false support of the way everybody thinks. And so we never are, are forced to take the gospel down here into the gut and the heart and to say, why am I doing all this? Do I really believe all this? Or in, in fact, is this the easy way here in Cincinnati? Is this the easy way? Because it's sort of the way everybody thinks. So you have a lot of people who never take any journeys of individuation or self-actualization. It's just conventional. Conventional, bland, what I call last night bourgeois thinking. There's no power to it. There's just no gut to it. There's no heart to it. There's no freedom to it. There's no truth to it. It, they've never had to taste it. They never had to suffer for it. They never had to what Jesus does in this morning Eucharist uh, spill their blood for it. Uh, there's been no agonizing for this truth. I think this is part of what Jesus is describing. Where I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of their own household. And anyone who prefers father or mother to me is not worthy of me. Now, if you think that's radical in our society, go to a Semitic society where everything is family. Everything is loyalty to your family. You break the rules of the family and you are excommunicated. You are, you are alienated. I, I, I don't think we begin to appreciate the power of that unless we've lived in that kind of culture where you, you, uh, you go against your father uh, and his rules for the household, and uh, you're just cut off. You're cut off from the inheritance. You're cut off from visiting. You're, you're not a part of the family anymore. You're dead. You're dead. And into the midst of a people who think that way, Jesus makes remarks like that. Huh? Again, as I said last night, we're not talking about cozy 
uh, you know, family environments. He's talking about the big family, the big world. And what does he say right after? Anyone who does not take his cross and follow in my footsteps is not worthy of me. So he, he, he doesn't doubt this is going to be a cross. That very phrase has been softened now by usage to take up our cross. We've all heard that since we've been kids. Huh? So we don't get the punch of it anymore, what that might mean. The cross is not simply enduring your hangnail for the day for the love of Jesus, all right? Or, or putting up with the inconvenience that your air conditioner doesn't work, all right? That's, that's what it's become in affluent societies, you know? And I guess maybe that's the best we can do when we're used to our air conditioner and it doesn't work. Well, I'm going to offer this up for Jesus. You know? And that's, you know. no, the cross is precisely that suffering which comes into our life by the choices we make for the kingdom. Right? And I, in other words, maybe I can't take this job, this job which would allow my family to, to live with greater security and greater comfort. You know? Because I realize if I do, I'm going to be earning all my life's wages supporting the military-industrial complex. And my conscience says, no, I do not want to build weapons of war the rest of my life. And so I have to pay the price for that. Now that's the cross. That's the cross that Jesus embraced, that he actively goes out and he knows it's coming. In that sense, he sets his face toward Jerusalem and seeks it. This is the price of being true to the call to the kingdom. This is the price of... of of recognizing the absolute and everything else becoming relative, including the economic system, including the political system. It's a proclaiming that, that God is Lord, that Jesus is Lord in this case, and therefore everything else is not Lord. And that's, that's where the kingdom proclamation relativizes all of reality. Because if Jesus is Lord, then America is not Lord. It's that simple. If Jesus is Lord, then the Pentagon is not Lord. If Jesus is Lord, then the gross national product and economic development is not Lord. And yet, when all is said and done, it seems to me, again and again, I meet good Catholics. And that, in fact, is their doctrine. Those are their doctrines, and those are their dogmas. Don't knock them. Don't knock the free enterprise system. Right? Don't knock capitalism. Don't knock the military-industrial complex. And you say, what are your real doctrines? What is your real dogma that you will not allow to be questioned or criticized? And I almost wonder if the religious doctrines, again, aren't a front. Keep, keep all of these up front, because they've been allowed to become the protection for what are my real doctrines, which is the status quo, the system as I like it, the system as I know it. Now, who's most free to talk that way? people who are the beneficiaries of the system. <laughs> people who are beneficiaries of the system. People who are on the top of the system. People who are enjoying the fruits of the system. And I, I as a white, Anglo-Saxon male cleric, uh, I'm in that most elite group. Right? We are the least oppressed people on this earth. We have never been, uh, been on the bottom of any system. Right? We're always the beneficiaries. And, we're always on top. And so it's most difficult for, for us to proclaim the kingdom to, to people like ourselves and to hear it ourselves because we, we basically don't see what the problem is. You know, What's the difficulty? I don't see that anything's wrong. Of course you don't, Richard, see that anything's wrong because you're on the top of it and you're enjoying all the fruits of it. And so that's why this class, people like myself, you know, and people like uh, many Americans can... They gradually, year by year, move to the more self-protective, conservative, preservative position. Huh? Keep it as it is. Keep it as it is. What the kingdom is precisely saying is you cannot any longer think of business as usual. The world as we know it is passing away. And stop uh, giving your allegiance to this world. Stop giving your allegiance to the systems and the loyalties of this world. We've allowed our American people to think they could do that. We've allowed our American Catholics to think they could bow before America, they could bend the knee to militarism and still bend the knee to God and know what they're doing. And that's why Jesus says you can't do it both ways. You simply can't. 
One of, you have to say no somewhere to say a, a meaningful yes to God. Or otherwise, to just say yes everywhere, none of them finally end up being a yes. And that's why the full proclamation of the kingdom is always announcing the truth and denouncing the lies. You've got to have both to fully be an evangelist. What we've been tempted to do is the one side of it. Right? Keep announcing, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. But brothers and sisters, unless we denounce what's keeping people from love, what's keeping people from truth, and what's keeping people from surrender, the announcing has as little effect after a while. It, doesn't, there, it has no depth. There's no place for people to receive it because they're basically in love with, with this world, its false promises, its seductions, its rewards. And, and then, then you tell them God loves me. Oh, okay, God loves me, but it's very, very superficial. There's no way they can take that inside because basically their heart is loyal to something else. It's like having two lovers. You can't, if any of you have ever tried. Huh? You can't. It is, it's the nature of the human psyche. We're t- the nature of the human soul. We're too finite. Huh? You can't give yourself totally over here and have a, your energy and your emotion, your heart filled with this, and then say it's also surrendered over here. But we've tried. God knows we've tried. And uh, it seems to me it's catching up with us. And if our conservative brothers and sisters and, and even the conservative element of the church, the good conservative element of the church, has... Some, some important points it's making. I think one of those is, is that we've reached the limits of liberalism. And what I mean by the limits of liberalism is liberalism is basically a philosophy which, which uh, proclaims the, the rights and the freedoms and the growth and the development of the individual. Right? My rights, my career, my wholeness, my options, my, my, my. And, and there, there's something very good about that, the protecting of, of, of the person. And, and, and Vatican II really bought that agenda, bought that agenda of the growth of the individual Christian and the freedom of the individual Christian. And we had to run with it. We had to run with it for 20 years. And, and we tasted its fruits, and thank God, and I don't want to go back on any of those, but all I'm saying is we've reached the limits of it, where it moves to, to a, a place where all we have are individuals seeking their own growth, their own happiness, and their own development. Huh? And there's no possibility anymore for the common good. There's no possibility for surrendering myself and what I need right now in terms of instant gratification for what's good for the whole parish, for what's good for the whole diocese, what's good for, for, for the whole people, huh? what's good for the world, not just what's good for America. It's almost like our people don't know how to think that way anymore. Now, here's the rub. that The temptation, when you reach the limits of liberalism and individual development and individual growth and everything, the temptation, especially of institutions like our own, is you, you think everything's going to the dogs and everybody's uh, you know, not surrendering anymore, and so you want to pull back into law and order. That's what's happening right now. <laughs> want to pull back into control and law and order. I'm convinced the real way to move beyond the limits of liberalism huh, is to move to radicalism, not back into conservatism. To really call people. Remember what radicalism means. That word scares Americans. It shouldn't. All right? It means to, to deal with the root instead of the symptoms. Huh? And gospel radicalism is to really deal with what's trapping people to really deal with the liberation that you and I need in our hearts and our souls. And that's where the Spirit, I'm convinced, is calling the church right now to finally deal with gospel radicalism and the real surrender that the gospel demands of us. But as always, as you might expect, many in the church instead are feeling the call is back to law and order. That will never produce great Christians. It produces another kind of security system instead of the real solidarity and the real surrender that the gospel is talking about. People who are able to, to be satisfied. I have obeyed the law. I have fulfilled the requirements by, by uh, responding to what is usually a gospel of minimals. So the kingdom is not the church. The kingdom is not the system of this world. It's precisely not that. Neither is the kingdom heaven. And that's a most common mistake that religious people make. 
that the kingdom is the same as heaven. We're going to go to the kingdom. No way. That's not what the New Testament is saying. In fact, the saints who are in eternal life, whatever eternal life is, are joining with us in praying for the coming of the kingdom. For the coming of the kingdom. And what is the kingdom? As Jesus describes it again and again in his parables and his sermons, it's when God's truth and this world overlap. This world. When God's truth is able to break into this world and some people are free enough from the lies and the seductions and the false promises to live in this world in the final state of affairs, in the final reality, to live the really real right now in 1987. Those people are rare to meet kingdom people, real kingdom people who have not been bought out by the promises and seductions of this world. But they know the truth. They've lived, as I said last night, at that that place where all things are one. They know what lasts, what's eternal, and they live the eternal life now in the temporal life. And and that's why they're like people from another planet, as I was saying last night, because they just don't respond to the things that the rest of us respond to. They don't need the things that the rest of us seem to need. That's not where it's at for them. They're not into prestige. They're not into possessions. They're not into power. And by the way, those are the three that Jesus preaches against most often. Power, prestige, and possessions. As the three seductions of the world, those are the temptations that he himself has to overcome in the desert. The temptation to power, the temptation to possessions, and especially ego possessions, and the temptation to prestige. And look, look at the Western church itself has again and again sold out to those very things. And so has lost the power to proclaim the kingdom because the the church itself, making an idol of itself, again and again, surrenders to the need for power and prestige and possessions instead of walking that, that, that vulnerable journey. So kingdom existence is like threshold existence, if I can call it that. It's between this world and the next, between what has been and what will be. And and, and so it's standing in a tenuous kind of place, a a scary kind of place, where where you don't walk in and, and sink in your roots. And that's what I think we've told our people they could do. Build your mansions right here. Find your securities right here. Build all the big barns you want and fill them with your securities and you can still know Jesus. When you proclaim the kingdom, let me warn you, at least if we're to believe the New Testament and I have to say at this point to believe my own experience, the reaction you can expect from good, proper church people when you really proclaim the kingdom is outrage and scandal. Outrage and scandal. How dare you question these sacrosanct things? Precisely because we've allowed them to think these these relative things are absolute. In our country today, they call you a communist, which is a big, great umbrella word to cover anything they don't want to deal with. Anything that questions the real, historical, social, practical, economic order of reality, which I want to be religious, but don't touch that level of my life. It's untouchable. And so we see our our bishop's recent pastoral on on economics. First of all, it's sad that it took 2,000 years after Christ for us finally to explicate that the gospel has has, practical implications. 2,000 years before such a pastoral was written by any bishop's group that I know of, ever. And then after that's done, we hear statistics like 80% of our Catholic laity in America either don't think it should have been written or don't understand it or don't agree with it. Hmm? You realize we got our work cut out for us, huh? In pointing out the integrity of the gospel, the fullness of the gospel, the implications of the gospel, that God's truth has to overlap with this world. And we can't keep up this dualism, this this religious world, and then this world where it's business as usual. Hmm? And, and people even love to say that, and it cuts off the discussion. Well, Father, you've got to be realistic, Father. I've got to have p- uh, food on the table and all these little cliches that suddenly are supposed to close down the discussion. Huh? And there's nothing more to talk about because I've got to put food on the table. Well, that's not the question, all right? 
But we're so far from that integration. We, we have not talked about the putting of this together for so long that when we begin to, the immediate response is outrage and scandal from good people. You know, our problem isn't the atheists, you know, or the non-believers or the pornography peddlers. Huh? Our, our problem in the reform of, of the church and the, and the call of the gospel is with our people themselves who have, have not heard a gospel of surrender, but a gospel of security. I believe that, that much of our guilt, much of our low self-image, much of our self-hatred, much of our self-preoccupation is because we are living in a world, settled in a world, at home in a world that Jesus told us never to move into in the first place. And so people's criteria of success our young people's criteria of whether they're lovable is whether they have Jordache genes, whether they're going to the right kind of school, driving the right kind of car. But who taught them that? We ourselves. Because huh? we have bought those kind of values. And we've allowed our young people to take them up. So when, when you've got to have a slim and svelte body, you know, two-thirds of young girls in America suddenly hate themselves. Well, who gave them that definition? And we've allowed them to think that was okay. Huh? When we allow the world of of competition and power and success and dominance to be that important. All of their fathers are striving to be number one, and only one guy can be number one on the, the team. Well, what does that mean? Nine-tenths of the boys in the, in the high school hate themselves and don't feel good about themselves because we've given our people, or allowed our people to accept, I should say, the agenda of the world instead of the agenda of the kingdom. And you can give them all the affirmation courses you want. They're still going to hate themselves as long as they live in that junkyard, as long as they live in that world of false promises, false assumptions about what, what goodness is, what success is, what accomplishment is. I really don't think religious education, no matter how up to date we get it, is going to make a bit of difference as long as we keep make, allowing people to think that they can buy the agenda of this world and they can live by its criteria of success and still feel good about themselves. There's no way they're going to feel good about themselves. They, in fact, they shouldn't feel good about themselves. They shouldn't. Because the, the Lord has telling, told us that's not the meaning of your soul. That's not the meaning of life. To have the right kind of body, to be number one, to be in control, to have beautiful hair, to be driving a, a, a lovely car and living on the right side of town. John puts it this way in, in 1 John, the second chapter. The love of the Father cannot be in any person who loves the world because nothing the world has to offer, the sensual body, the lustful eye, pride and possessions. Those were for many centuries considered the three sources of evil. Remember, we had different words for it. Huh? Lust of the eye, hmm? lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I call it Superficiality, sensuality, and showiness. Hmm? Superficiality, sensuality, and showiness. Hmm? People who are into trendiness, people who are into images, people who really waste their time watching soap operas and Dallas and Dynasty and still think they can understand the spiritual life. You know? Ridiculous. It, garbage in, garbage out. You take th those kind of ridiculous, absurd images into your mind every day. And how many of our Catholic people think, no problem, no problem. Huh? I, I, can, I can absorb all that junk I want and still have a prayer life. There's no way, because your perception is so utterly dulled as to the meaning of relationship, as to the meaning of vulnerability. The gospel idealizes littleness and poverty. And then we have Joan Collins walking in, you know, in a new gown every five minutes. You know? Well, you take those images in all the time. How can you possibly? I can read the gospel to you 50 times. You're not going to believe it. You believe Joan Collins, not me. Huh? And we're powerless to, to proclaim the gospel. When, when we tell people they can live in that world of superficiality, sensuality, and showiness. The world of image. Constant world of image. The outer world. Nothing the world has to offer. The sensual body, the lustful eye, pride and possessions could ever come from the Father, but only from the world. And the world, with all it craves for, is coming to an end. 
I know that must sound very old-fashioned to be talking that way. I, I mean, I myself, of course, I was formed in the great 60s, you know, secular city. Uh, I'm a Franciscan. We've always prided ourselves on incarnational theology, loving this world. And I still believe that. What's the difference? What am I saying? I'm talking out of two sides of my mouth. I'm saying you can't really love the world. It, it, it doesn't mean anything to say that until you're free from the falseness of the world, from the, from the superficial images of the world, to really love this world and its beauty and its goodness and its truth and its true freedom. You, in fact, have to first of all say no before you can say yes. And that was the missing link. We gave people the impression they could say yes right away, right? Before they discriminated, before they they sifted darkness and light, before they could tell the difference between what's real and what's unreal. Just, yes, love the world. The world will make you happy. And so we bought the world lock, stock, and barrel. Robert Bella, already back in the 50s, uh, as a sociologist, wrote a book called Protestant Catholic Jew. And in that, he analyzed the American religious scene. And he said that, simply sociologically speaking, after all is said and done, there was no real difference between Protestants, Catholics, and Jews in America. They all believed, in fact, the same set of doctrines. They cover it up with a bunch of Catholic jargon, a bunch of Protestant jargon, or Jewish jargon. But in fact, they all believe in the same identical religion. And he called that religion, and the term has since become an American term, the American dream. Our real religion is the American dream, the American system, and all the benefits that accrue to us, and all the comforts and conveniences that it promises us. That's what we will defend at any cost. And all you need to look at is the arms race today to understand that. When you possess this much and you're this comfortable, even though you're only 6% of the world's population and you're consuming now near 50% of the world's resources, you're going to go to any extent, to any extent, to protect the privilege that we've grown used to and the lifestyle that we think now we have a right to. We really think we have a right to it because it's the only thing we've ever known for the last 20 years or 30 years. And and we've got to, as Catholic Christians, begin to make the connections. Begin to make the connections between these other brothers and sisters who share the bread with us and who share the cup with us. And I've got got to finally ask, how are they brothers and sisters? And are we really kingdom people? Or are we, after all is said and done, really American people? I think all things being equal, the... uh, the Catholic people, have the greatest chance to make this breakthrough. Because, after all is said and done, um, we're the only international institution after the United Nations. And our missionaries keep coming back. Our friends and and, uh, our brothers and sisters from other countries keep telling us there's a bigger picture. There's a bigger picture. There's a bigger world than the United States of America. And I think together with with Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom, the big picture, the big system, and with with our church understanding of itself as as an international group of people, I think we're going to get converted. And the kinds of things our bishops have been writing in the last six years give us hope, yes. Our eyes are opening. We could be the most unliberated people. We could be the most jaded, sophisticated, and blinded people. And in all truth, many of our people are unbelievably blind while thinking that they see, while thinking that they see, which is the greatest kind of blindness, who think they don't need liberation, who think that Time and Newsweek really tell them the truth and are content with that worldview and think that that's adequate to help them to deal with the world seen today. Now, those people, it's it's only the Lord's Word. It's only the, the, the Lord's Gospel that will ever break open that blindness, but we know that, it, that we also share in that blindness. And uh, the gospel really is our hope like never before. The gospel really is the hope of the world. And the church, as a means for proclaiming that gospel, as a means to, to bring about that kingdom, I believe, all things being equal, and you know I'm free to criticize, but I'm also free to recognize, I hope, that uh, we could well be the, the kingpin, if you will, 
in this whole unraveling, in this whole opening, because the Catholic people, after all is said and done, are still Catholic, right? are still universalists. And we still hearken back to that, that historic principle, which we're again rediscovering, of the common good. What's for the sake of the common good? Maybe that was our way of, of describing the kingdom. Maybe that was our way of coming close to the kingdom. And I think, uh, at least as I'm preaching in this country, I hear uh, more and more people like yourselves who at least will hear me out, and I hope hear the Lord out, and say there might just be some truth here. And that gives me great hope for the American church, even though I believe in great part our people are still blinded by the, by the system. So what do you do with all this? Well, as I've often said, don't believe it because I just said it. Don't believe it because uh, a priest said it. Believe it because you're going to go back to the gospel and read the gospels for yourselves. And try to read them not through the eyes of privilege, not through the eyes of protection, not through the eyes of power, of the top, what, are we, what can we preserve and protect and keep together. Try to read the gospel through the eyes of the little people of the world and see what they say. And then you say, my gosh, the gospel is word of, a, a word of liberation. The gospel is a word of freedom. The gospel is a word of newness. The gospel is talking about a new creation, a new society in this world that is made possible by the unconditional love of God. And once we've experienced and lived in that place of the unconditional love of God, the relative loves of this world don't have much power over us anymore. So believe it because the gospel tells you, because Jesus calls you, not because of any words I might have said. As I said in the beginning, the most I can do is is stir the pot, huh? stir up the pot. But finally, the Lord has to be, has to be your teacher.